I remember that as a kid. I don't remember a lot of when I was a kid, but I remember this. Whoever believes in me would never be hungry and thirsty. And I thought, oh, that'd be great. Then I don't have to worry about going in to, to eat all the time because I can play all the time. I don't have to worry about eating or drinking. You know? And I believed that up until about two years ago. And then uh, the pastor friends and Elaine were giving me the you know, in text study saying, no, that's not what it means exactly, but you're close. I wonder about... Um, I wonder about Thanksgiving. What? I wonder what the true meaning of Thanksgiving is and uh, what we've done as a, as a culture, um, where we've turned it, where we're going from here. What does it mean? How does this relate to, to what Jesus is saying in the Gospels and, and what Paul is saying in the epistles and, and what God was saying to Moses in the Old Testament in these readings? boils down to, you know, God is the center and the seat of all this stuff. And that's really, the, if you boil away all the, the, the other meanings, it's God is the one who is, who is in charge. God is the one who, who is the, who's the one that provides, has provided for people. You know, the, these, uh, these Hebrews living in Egypt being tormented and oppressed, you know, and, and being slaves and being freed to go out into the land and, and to suffer a few things. You know, they, they went hungry for a little bit, but God provided the quail, the manna, and the, the water, and protection from the, the, the um, Egyptians who chased after them, and, and whatever else. And we see that Jesus is saying, you know, when it boils down to this too, it's, it's not so much of, you know, what you eat. And that's important because we have to live, but it's, it's, it's that food that God gives to us. You're seeing right here and now the, the example of, of, of God incarnate through me, that I am the bread, I, I give you life. God gives you life, and I am showing you the way. Never really understood much of that when I was a kid. But as I get older, my understanding gets more developed, but with probably more life experiences that I have. I remember growing up in a small town in southeastern Minnesota, population 1,800, small farming community. And what you did for work was work on the farms. Any farmers needed help, you would, you would, they would call you and you'd work for them. You know, for $3 an hour, you'd be throwing bales in the, in the barn, or you'd be shoveling silage, you know, haylage off into the uh, silos down, or, or feeding the calves, or whatever it took. But you were trying to make the earth plentiful. And the, the farmers were, were smart. You know, they, they rotated all their crops so the corn didn't take all the nitrogen from the soil, but put some soybeans in there, let the land recover. They understood a sense of, of being with, with the lands. And then when you ate, you know, they didn't pay you much, but they sure fed you. You know, and as a 16-year-old, I could eat. And sometimes in my own mind, I still think I'm 16, and my body says, no, you're not. In a lot of ways. You can do that. No, you can't. Don't even try. But it was, it was a different experience growing up in small town Minnesota and then working in the, the projects in Chicago as a social worker. Kind of funny. They, they told us, you know, part of the training was you don't wear certain colors because there's are gang colors, black and whatever else. So I wore blue jeans and, and, and bl uh, blue um, jean jacket. The only problem was I drove a 1982 Crown Victoria and I came out there. And they, I'm sure they thought, here's a cop coming. I said, no, I'm a social worker. I help you. I give you money. Don't, you know, don't do anything to my car. And then to see how people live from, from hand to mouth, you know, in a different kind of way. And, and for them to say, well, stealing is just another way of life, isn't it? And I grew up in this Protestant work ethic and thinking, no, that's not, but I don't understand where you're coming from, so talk some more. And they, they told me, you know, I, I'm a listener, but they could tell me things, and they could go on and on and vent for, for an hour on end about what's going on with their lives, eight kids in the same apartment because they can't afford, and you know, people on top of each other, and, and they don't know where their next meal is coming from. I said, well, what about the wealth? We're on welfare because if I work at McDonald's, I make less money and then we can't eat. 
or who watches my kids or all this kind of stuff and I'm just thinking I don't have a clue what they're talking about. Come to our eighth grade graduation. Okay. And I'm the only white face there. That's a different kind of feeling. These people that don't have much, but they have each other. They're thankful for whatever they've got. I grew up not having much either, in a different kind of way. I lived on a farm in the middle of nowhere, and, and I didn't have to worry about people with guns in my neighborhood or around the house. I was pretty safe. These kids, you know, you better leave. The gangs are coming. Get in my car and leave. It's every day it's like that. And yet, they have a sense of, of feeling like God is good. And I heard that. God is great. And I had to sit and think about that. I had to wrestle with that theologically and socially. What does that mean for them who have next to nothing in, in their lives or in danger a good part of their time? And the kids are, are afraid of they're going into gangs or they're, or they're trying to stay out of gangs. And it's a whole different life. And yet... The bottom line is they're thankful. And it made me think about my life and what I'm thankful for and what I take for granted. Even now that you know we're doing fairly well, better than my parents did when I was growing up. And what I take for granted and, and what, I, what I need and what I have is, you know, what I want, what I need are different things sometimes. You know, with, with changes going on in, in society and culture, and we see that. Um, we have to sit back and think that God is still the God of grace and the God of mercy and the God of presence and the God of abundance. And we who think that we have nothing to give, we have plenty to give. It may not be monetary necessarily, and although we have that too, but it says of ourselves. We have more than enough to give in small doses sometimes make a big difference in our lives. Jesus said, don't work for the bread that you eat. Well, we need to eat too. But work for the compassion, the relationships with people. You know, when, when I was ordained, my brother preached. And it was on this John passage after Jesus came back. And Peter said, uh, he was talking to Peter, and he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, you know I love you. And Jesus asked him that three times, and Peter was dismayed and said, I, I, you know I do, and you just have to believe me, and, and what must I do? And Jesus said, well, feed my sheep and tend my lambs, and basically, not only literally feed people, but figuratively take care of people. That's how you love Jesus, that's how you love him. In your abundance, you, you provide for others who may be in need. And I'm in need sometimes, too, and I need people to provide for me. And the humility that comes with that, too, that it's not only blessed to give, but it's blessed to receive as well at times and to allow other people to be part of that for you. My, my uh, intern pastor would say, you know, when I'm hurting, you let the congregation su sustain you. You let them help you because it's a two-way street. There's an abundance of compassion, and you have to be open to it as well, to receive as well as give. So the bread we talk about, the bread that endures is that, that connection, that connection point with others, that connection point with God through others. And so that we see no matter what happens in our society, whatever government there is, we have an obligation through our commitment to Christ to be there for other people. It's always been that way, no matter what's been going on in the world. You know, the Jews in Nazi Germany were connected together. The Native Americans come together for a common cause. You, you know, people do that in their abundance of presence sometimes, as God is abundant to them and to us in, in His presence to us. We remember in this Thanksgiving that it's, it's God who is the one providing for us in our abundance of many things, of many things. Amen.